With that understanding, let's begin to take a closer look at the scientists advising the governments around the world and the World Health Organization. Let's take a closer look at their links to the pharma industry. So let's start with of your Professor Neil Ferguson, right? Mr. Mr. All-Star, who helped kick off all of this madness with his ridiculous theoretical model. So he's a former consultant, paid consultant from GlaxoSmithKline, Ralph Miller Roche, and he comes from Imperial College London, who, like I said, they're in partnership with the big pharmaceutical companies. And the first major red flag, I mean, aside from his past history, right? We, we can actually start, let's start with his past history. Already 2009 swine flu, he produced a theoretical model that claimed that 7.5 million people would die. Because of this, it resulted in billions of dollars being spent on vaccines. And in the end, about 14,000 people died. I mean, the moment somebody does this, naturally, whether you are the media, whether you are the government, whether you are the World Health Organization, you should have suspicions. I mean, this was ridiculous. This guy did this. He's got past relationships past links to the pharmaceutical industries that will profit from a pandemic and he produced this ridiculous model just 10 years ago and now he's doing the same thing right again over here this this research paper which was never published in a scientific journal never ever peer-reviewed which claimed that 40 million people would die as if the original prediction he made 10 years ago when the swine flu was not bad enough he says 40 million people will die Unless we start to do these stringent lockdowns, these, these crazy quarantines and lockdowns and shut down the world economy and forced unemployment, unless we do that. Well, since that time, other researchers, other scientists have looked into this study, this mathematical, ridiculous study, and they claim that it's totally unreliable and it's impossible to read. So in my opinion, Professor Neil Ferguson, he needs to be investigated criminally. Because he's putting, he, not, is he, he's not just only doing it now, he's already done it. He's put people's lives at risk. And I guarantee you that people have died prematurely as a result of his fear-mongering and his social isolation policies. So this, this big red flag is what I'm saying here. Obvious conflicts of interest, right? Obvious conflicts of interest. But rather than focusing on this and the media going into depth and exploring this more as they have done, what we find is this ridiculous tabloid headline, right? Remember what I said inattentional blindness. It's a tactic to obviously induce inattentional blindness. Oh geez, people are starting to become aware how illegitimate all of this is in this guy's terrible history. So let's come up with this tabloid news headline. And don't get me wrong, this has its place and its position to just help illustrate and help us understand how this guy, he doesn't believe the shit that he's feeding us. Right? The stuff that he's trying to sell us, he himself doesn't buy into, which is to do these lockdowns. But beyond that, this is just a tabloid the ridiculous headline. There's far more significant important things going on with his character that we need to look into. Then beyond him, there's this lady of yeah, Maria Zambon. She's the director of reference microbiology for public health. Maria Zambon also comes from Imperial College London and she has done past work for Sanofi, Novartis, CSL, which is uh, the owner of Sequeris, and GlaxoSmithKline. And she was also involved in the whole swine flu pandemic thing. She was one of the individuals whose advice encouraged the World Health Organization to declare the swine flu to be a pandemic. So just, just huge red flags. And now they're advising the government again, like they didn't do a bad enough job the first time around. It's crazy. And then we have another guy from Imperial College London, and he currently serves on CEPI. And we're going to go into who CEPI is a little bit more later on. Essentially, it's a big pharma front company. That's Pretty much what it is. We're going to get into that later. And he's also worked for Takeda Pharmaceuticals and also the Gates Foundation. And just to illustrate one more time, guys, and I am going to, like I said, repeat myself because I want it to resonate. I want this to sink in. It's a problem that these people are coming from Imperial College London, not only because of the partnerships they have with the pharmaceutical companies that are going to profit from this, this pandemic, but because they themselves are profiting from it. Right? They just, as you can see over here, where they posted that they have received a further 18.5 million pounds in taxpayers' money from the UK government to create a coronavirus vaccine. So just obvious conflicts of interest. And then a fourth person. So we have four people that are from Imperial College London that are now advising the UK government on something that's going to benefit them. 
This lady over here, Professor Alison Holmes, she's one of the directors of the National Institute for Health Research, and she's also done past work for Merck and Company. And we have Dr. Mary Ramsey, she's the head of immunization at Public Health England, she's done past work for GlaxoSmithKline and Pfizer. And remember, I want you to recall how dodgy these organizations are. From a moral standpoint, I, I would never, ever do work for these companies. And then these two over here, they are a couple, and together, they were, between the two of them, they've done work for Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and GlaxoSmithKline. This is Robert West and Susan Michi. And then we have this dude over here, a little bit higher up the totem pole. He's the chief medical officer for England, Jonathan Fantam. He's uh, the deputy chief, sorry, medical officer for England. And he's held a high ranking positions in GlaxoSmithKline after the Roche and Sanofi guys. And then the big dog, Sir Patrick Vallance, he's the chief scientific advisor for the UK government. And he came from being the head of research and development at GlaxoSmithKline. Now some people will say, oh, you know, well, he, he used to work there. So what's the big deal with that, Gavin? The big deal, as I've already shown, so evidence-based, aligned with reality, aligned with the truth, is that GlaxoSmithKline, they have a policy, as do other big pharma companies, they have a policy, clearly, as you can see, it's an unwritten policy because you can't put that stuff out there. But based on their history, they have a policy of trying to make experts, scientific advisors, doctors, and medical authorities appear as being independent without disclosing their interests with GlaxoSmithKline. So when somebody's coming from GlaxoSmithKline, that's a red flag. It just, it warrants further investigation and, and scrutiny. Then beyond the UK government, we have obviously the United States government, the White House Coronavirus Task Force, right? Let's take a closer look at them. So we have Robert Redfield, he's the director of the CDC. As I already explained, guys, the CDC Foundation are very close to the big pharma companies, either receiving funding or in partnership with them. And we have Dr. Stephen Hahn, the head of the FDA. And a number of individuals who are formerly, uh, former heads of FDA, have also got close relationships with the big pharma companies. I'm going to mention two of them, another two ones in this presentation. As I said, the FDA is currently in partnership through the Biomarkers Consortium with the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, which is a huge lobbying organization for the big pharma companies. Another red flag. I mean, it's just the conflicts of interest are just outrageous. And then these two dudes from the NIH, right? We pretty much all know who Anthony Fauci is and then Francis Collins, who's the director of the NIH. And the NIH is also in partnership with this lobbying group, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. But if you take a look at the NIH's foundation, you, they are just packed. The board members are, it's just the big, big pharma companies. It's crazy. I mean, like I said, their tentacles are just reaching everywhere. And given the history, given their dodgy tactics, covering up cancer, experimenting on civilians, bribery, 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 and more bribery, those are red flags, guys, right? And then if we take a closer look at Anthony Fauci, we see that he has either worked closely in collaboration or been instrumental in PEPFAR, which is the US President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and then the Decade of Vaccines collaboration. And if we take a look at PEPFAR, Anthony Fauci has been described as the so-called architect of PEPFAR. Well, you know, PEPFAR works very closely with the big pharmaceutical companies. Currently, they're in partnership with Merck & Company, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, and then Gilead Sciences, which are all set to profit from this. And once again, we have the Gates Foundation. You can find the Gates Foundation's fingerprints are just all over this, guys. And then beyond that, we also have the, dec the decade, excuse me, of vaccines collaboration, which is the Gates Foundation and the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. Well, if we take a closer look at Gavi, it was founded, two of the founding members of significance to us here, is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the IFPMA, right? The big pharma conglomerate, pretty much, that, uh, that represents all the pharma companies, the International Federation Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association. And they are founding with a partner, although they are not shown at the forefront that way. If you take a look at the actual paperwork, the IFPMA was a co-founder, a co-founding member of the Gavi Vaccine Alliance. And Gavi is in many ways. That's another front group, guys. We're going to get into it in more, more detail later on. So he, he very much clearly has links to the big pharma companies as well, guys. Then we have, of course, um, Deborah Burks. She's the ambassador at large of PEP4, which is significant, as I already explained, who's behind them. And she's also a board member of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And again, if we look at the Global Fund, it's a partnership. It was founded by the Gates Foundation. 
And it's also a partnership with a bunch of private industry partners, but one of them is Decatur Pharmaceuticals. So they are, the, the influence of Big Pharma is there is what I'm saying. It's more indirect, but it is there. Then we have uh, the US Secretary of Health, Alex Azar. Well, Alex Azar, he was a, a former Big Pharma lobbyist, and he was the president of the US division of Eli Lilly and Company, which I explained earlier, Eli Lilly and Company, that's the company that uh, supplied the CIA with the, uh, the LSD that they were using in MK Ultra, and he's a former board member of the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Then we have Joe Grogan, and this is another dude, another former lobbyist for Gilead. So we see the influence of the big former companies. It's, it's just everywhere, guys. And that is, like I said, it's a red flag. You can't have the companies that are set to profit from this. You can't have people who have either past or present relationships with them then advising governments. It's a, an obvious conflict of interest. I shouldn't have to even explain that. And Gilead of the IEC, they are announcing a $3,120 price tag for the COVID-19 drug that they are developing. But this drug was developed using taxpayer money. And that's another topic for another day. But if you look into it, that's precisely what happens. Taxpayers pay for the development of these drugs that they have to pay for. The corruption is just, it's so, it's, it's profound. It's mind-numbing. It's, it's so disturbing, guys. And then it's no surprise, Donald Trump. He, he ended up naming this guy to be his so-called vaccine czar, to be in, uh, in charge of so-called Operation Warp Speed, which is to fast-track the vaccine. And then yeah, in South Africa, who's advising the South African government, take a closer look at them. And whatever, I'm not going to go through every country, guys. Obviously, that would take days to, you know, for you to watch a presentation going through every single country. But wherever you are, whoever you are, take a closer look. And you are going to find the influence of the big pharma companies in one way or another. So here we have Professor Muhammad Yunus Musa. He's the chief specialist and head of the Department of Infectious Diseases at the University of KwaZulu Natal. And he has done work for Pfizer. You know, Pfizer experimenting on kids without parental consent in Nigeria, which resulted in 11 or 12 of their deaths. And then we have these two individuals together. They chair the Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis at the National Institute for Communicable diseases and that's Cheryl Cohen and Anne von Gottberg von Gottberg is probably how it's pronounced and they've both done work for Pfizer and they've both done work for Sanofi and then Anne von Gottberg has also done work for Novartis and then Professor Helen Rios she's a big time player she's very influential and she serves on many different groups as you can see over here with the Gavi Alliance and CEPI we're going to get into them a little bit more later on in detail then also the Gates Foundation so she chairs the Gavi Program and Policy Committee. She also chairs the Scientific Advisory Board for CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. Uh, she chairs the African Regional Immunization Technical Advisory Group as well, which is uh, for the World Health Organization. And then she's a member of the Sabine Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group. So she, she's very influential, guys. Very influential scientist. And we're going to see you again momentarily. Oh, yes, and just... So people understand the Sabine Aspen Vaccine Science and Policy Group is also a lot of influence with Big Pharma over there, if you look into it. But it goes deeper than this, guys. We, there's a far more than material profit involved here, and we'll get into that in the second part of the presentation. And then the chair of this group is this dude over here, Professor Shabir Madi. I mean, this cat, he's just a, it's like a prostitute for the Big Pharma companies, it looks like. Janssen OVR, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Sanofi, Novartis, GlaxoSmithKline, Novavax, and he's also done work with the Gates Foundation. And these relationships are either very recently or they are currently happening, right? Some of them are a little bit further back, but I mean, all of it is, it's something we should be concerned with. Because when you look at the track record of these big pharmaceutical companies and their policies of, of just deceptive marketing and corruption and experimenting on civilians and covering up cancer and so on and so forth it's red flags guys it's huge red flags then we have sage the working group on covid19 vaccines this was just established in june so it's very recently we take a look at some of their members and again the influence is there but it's it's very indirect with some of them so you see here we have dr helen noyanek She's the chief physician at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, and she currently works on studies funded by the Innovative Medicines Initiative. 
So you probably think, yeah, well, what's the problem with that? I mean, that sounds innocuous. That doesn't sound like a problem. That sounds legit, right? Well, if we take a closer look, for example, the Innovative Medicines Initiative that's financed <laughs> by the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. That's another big pharma group. And then for the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare, they are, they are either in partnership or being funded by AstraZeneca, Novartis, and GlaxoSmithKline. In fact, GlaxoSmithKline is one of their top 10 donors. So again, the influence is there, it's just more indirect. That's how deception operates, guys. It wears a mask. It presents itself as a sheep, but inwardly, it's a wolf. And they know that. They know that we are beholden to appearances, unfortunately. Most people can be easily convinced just by appearance. And another example of this is over here, Dr. Fulake Ulayike, and we see she's with John Snow Incorporated, the Aspen Institute, and then the Maternal and Child Survival Program, all of which, I mean, it sounds legit, right? There, there can't be a problem there. Well, if you take a closer look, right, we see big farmers influence everywhere, and the Gates Foundations influence everywhere. All right, we just just got to become wise to these tactics, guys. Just got to dig a little bit deeper. Then we have this dude, Professor Peter Smith. He currently works for Sanofi, and he's also an advisor to Takeda and Sepi. And then another individual who's also advising the UK government is this guy again, Professor Nicholas Grassley of the Imperial College of London, and also who's advising the South African government. We have Professor Helen Rios. Then we have Helen. Talbot, she's a former principal investigator in Sanofi vaccine trials. And yeah, we have this dude named Professor Adam Finn. Um, he's either presently or in the past, he did paid consultancy work for GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi. And the reason why I say either past or present is because the source from which you get the information, which is Congress Med, they don't actually specify. But he's also a very influ influential individual, excuse me. He's the current head of Bristol Children's Vaccine Center. He's the current president of the European Society for Pediatric Infectious Diseases. And he's also the current chair of ETAGE, which is a group that actually advises the European region on immunization for the World Health Organization. And they are put forward as being quote unquote independent. But if you take a closer look, I mean, clearly they're not so independent. If this guy over here, he's done work for the pharmaceutical companies. Take a closer look, three of their members have got either past or present links to the pharmaceutical industry. Remember this dude that I pointed out earlier with the European Scientific Working Group on Influenza, which is essentially a front group for Big Pharma? Well, he's also a part of this so-called advisory independent group. And then there's also Professor Federico Martignon Torres, and he's with Sanofi, Glaxo, Glaxo Smith Klein, Novartis Pfizer, and Merkin Company. And then the big boy, right? I mean, this is an important guy that you've got to have on the payroll or have some influence over. The Director General of the World Health Organization, so-called doctor, because he's not a doctor, just take a closer look into it, Tedros Adhanom. And this dude over here for the past 15 years, he's worked for these different organizations. And again, if you look at it on the surface, right, the surface, it looks legitimate. You know, we've got, you know, from 2005 to 2009, he was the co-chair of the Partnership for Maternal, Newborn and Child Health. In 2007 to 2009, he was the chair of the Rollback Malaria Partnership. 2008 to 2009, he was a board member of Gavi, which is the Vaccine Alliance. 2009 to 2011, he was the chair of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. 2011 to 2017, to 2017, he was a member of the Aspen Institute, and currently, he's a steering member of every woman, every child, alongside Melinda Gates. So it sounds legit, I mean, what an outstanding record. But if we look deeper, what do we find? Once again, the Gates Foundation is involved in every single one of these organizations, either partnering or has directly founded these institutions, and also the big pharma companies, right? I mean, in, essentially, when, when you look at this dude, what you have to realize is he has a guy that for the past 15 years, he has worked extremely close with the big pharma companies, very, very close with the big pharma companies and the Gates Foundation. That requires some scrutiny and some further investigation for obvious reasons. And then also, if we see who's financing the World Health Organization, collectively, when you take into account the Gates Foundation and the Gavi Alliance, which are, they are pharma, big pharma partners. We're going to get into that in more detail 
in in a little bit guys but like i said already the gates foundation has huge investments in the big pharmaceutical industries and then the gavi alliance was co-founded by the ifpma by the big pharma industry itself but these are big pharma partners so we have two big pharma partners that are donating and that money cannot be used however the world health organization wants it has to be used for certain purposes you need to look into that donating over 900 million dollars which means that their collective input makes them the top donors of the world health organization that's a red flag especially when the world health organization is the one that is behind the declaration of the pandemic i mean the conflicts of interest are just everywhere guys and then no surprise yeah who does the world health organization name to to head their coronavirus vaccine drive a guy from GlaxoSmithKline, ex gsk chief andrew witty right now beyond this because what we have to understand this is setting a very dangerous precedent guys if we don't start to speak out in spite of the sense uh, of the censorship if we don't start to inform our family members about what's really going on and i'm going to get into uh, the disease itself all right i'm just this is just the beginning i want to help you understand the conflicts of interest we are still going to climb a mountain this is just the beginning right Tip of the iceberg but beyond what's going on with this COVID 19 thing it sets a dangerous precedent that in the future is going to be more pandemics declared because they see how easy it is for them and when they see how profitable how rich it makes them it's going to just encourage them to do it again and they're already talking about that now oh yeah you see china researchers discovered new swine flu with quote-unquote pandemic potential and this is a danger because there's a group called the pandemic influenza preparedness framework advisory group you've probably never heard of them before but their job is to train governments around the world on how they react and respond to when a pandemic is declared and if you take a closer look at them i mean i looked through the list and it's not too difficult to find this information on the world health organization's website it's fairly easy it comes up in the search results and you see at the bottom here a disclaimer and they try to make it sound like they're so aligned with integrity and it's benevolent we want to do the right thing nice world health organization and they explain that in order to enhance its management of conflicts of interest as well as strengthen public trust and transparency we've made all of these bios available for you to download which to me is undoubtedly the result of them getting uh, into trouble in the past with the so-called swine flu pandemic of 2009 2010 where they did not disclose the conflicts of interest which they claimed was an accident oh we just accidentally forgot to disclose those conflicts of interest so i have no doubt that's why they did this but if you look a bit closer so i went through all of these bios and you find nothing right so it seems okay well maybe they've turned over a new leaf <laughs> and this was easy to find but you know what was not easy to find was who is financing the group itself this pandemic influenza preparedness group well it's the big pharmaceutical companies i mean that's it, just the level of deception is mind-blowing oh you know we try to be transparent in our conflicts of interest we, we gave you these bios to download very easy to find but if you dig deeper and you look at who's actually giving them the funds what do you find sanofi GlaxoSmithKline, hoffman la roche novartis aquarius i mean it's it's just the level of deceit it's so surreptitious it's outrageous guys it's it's insane and i actually couldn't find this information on the world health organization site it took me a while to find it i had to go digging for it i originally found it on the ifpma's website because on there they brag how they have provided the world health organization with nearly 90 percent of pandemic influenza preparedness funds and this significantly contributes to securing pandemic doses for the next pandemic so what they are saying is they have secured contracts pretty much that their vaccines will get used and next the next time the pandemic is declared do you guys understand how dodgy and corrupt that is it's outrageous i mean it's so i feel like i'm living in the toilet it's just it's crazy man this stuff is it's insane so what do we have here we have a very extremely profoundly dangerous alliance guys where on the one side we have this dodgy industry with a terrible history of corruption like i said experimenting on innocent civilians without their knowledge covering up cancer bribing doctors and government officials on the one end and then on the other end we have all of these trusted authorities trusted universities like the imperial college london the world health organization we have the gates foundation and this is precisely why i said earlier 
Never blindly trust authority. Learn how to distinguish between truth and authority, between integrity and authority, because they are not the same thing.